Hey, I'm Alex Radcliffe from Board Game Co. And this is a Patreon selected video, a little bit of a, a different video than usual. One specifically in which I asked them for a whole bunch of titles of anything they want to hear my opinion on in the slightest whatsoever. That opinion will range from that's the best game ever to I got rid of it a long time ago to I never played it or heard of it or anything along those lines and I have no interest in it, any of that stuff. And there are going to be a lot of titles going over here. So I'm going to try to restrict myself to, well, let's aim for 10 to 15 seconds per game. It'll probably run into 30 seconds per game, but hopefully even with that, I can keep it to a manageable length. There are something like, I don't know, I can't count, but something like 50 or 60 tabs open on my screen. We'll go through each one of them as quickly as possible. Uh, there will be timestamps because I can't stop myself, but there will not be links to the individual games. <clears throat> and with that, with that, let's go ahead and start ourselves off with Judgment Eternal Champions, a game that was on Kickstarter. I didn't really look into this that much. I looked into it enough to cover it because I do those two back or not to backs, but effectively this one struck me probably because of the price of the miniatures. This one struck me more as a miniatures game than a skirmish game. That said, I know one of my patrons specifically has been asking me about it and talking to me about it, and I may look into it further to see if I can play it or try it or something at some point, but effectively, I don't really know enough about this one personally. Moving on to the next one. So, next up, we have Titans Historical Fantasy Miniature Board Game. This is from Go On Board. Go On Board, who just brought you The Witcher. And this is one that I was very excited about when I backed it. I'm still excited about it. I'm halfway through the rules in this one, but I haven't actually played it. It has that whole uh, area control control genre that I tend to like in games, or I should be more specific, area control genre that I like a lot of games that have it. Others don't make the cut because they're stacking up against Kemet, against the Kaladis, against Blood Rage, Inish, all of those games. Will this one make the cut? I don't know. It looks cool, looks interesting, looks different. Also, halfway through the rules, I feel like I won't be able to get enough done. But then again, that's a common thing that I feel whenever I'm halfway through rules. In fact, when I finish rules and then I play the game and I actually get enough done. That's going to be Titans. Then we have Runation. Runation. This is a game that I have played a few times. I will have a review of this one coming shortly. The very short version, to save you time in the review, is I think it's a solid game. I'm enjoying, speaking of area control, not holding up to other games in the genre. I think Runation is an excellent game. It reminds, it reminds me of Nexus Ops to a degree. At the same time, I like my, my games to allow me opportunities to either feel clever, to feel different, to have powerful moments. And Runation Relation ticks along at a general high the entire time, but it doesn't have those impactful moments of look at that amazing card I just got, look at this incredible battle I just had. It's just constantly fighting, attacking, going through it. Solid game. I can't put my finger exactly on the aspect of why it's not one that I'll be keeping in my collection, but I think it's primarily that aspect of, of it's good, but there's no high moment that makes it stand out for me. Moving on, we have, let me see my tabs over here. They're a little bit little high. Moving on, we have Decrypto. Decrypto is a party game that I absolutely have to try. This is one I have in my collection. I've heard this is better than Codenames. Codenames is like, what, a 7 point, not a 7.8. I don't remember what Codenames is rated, but it's lower than a 7.8. Although Codenames is a few points higher in terms of the overall BGG rankings, but that's because of the general popularity scale. BGG rankings are a combination of how high a game is rated, plus the number of people who rated that game. Uh, Decrypto has an aspect of Codenames where you're combining different wars and you have to try to give clues, but you're doing so with a secret keyword along the way. Everything about this game does seem like the kind of game I would like that I would enjoy. I just haven't gotten it to the table yet, but I absolutely want to. Then we have Four Gardens. Four Gardens is another one that I actually will have coverage of soon. This is one that I've played a few times as well. I need to put in my review on this one. Effectively, I like Four Gardens. I think the core gameplay is solid. The thing I do not like about it is ironically the thing that most people pay attention to, which is going to be that tower. That tower that's going to stand out as something on the table as table presence. I don't like it. I think it obscures. You can't see what's going on on the other side, and then you can't really plan for your turn until it's your turn because the tower is constantly rotating. I don't like that in games. Give me opportunity to try to figure out what I need to do, not I have to wait till it's my turn before I can actually plan things out because you change the tower along the way. Uh, the tower for me uh, ruins what is otherwise a fairly elegant game. I think the Four Gardens is a solid game, but not one I'm keeping because of the tower. Moving on, we have Great Western Trail, a game that I tried, I got rid of, I tried again, played a few times, got rid of it again, and it's one that I may or may not get it back again when they have the reprint from Plan B Games because... This is a game, this is going to be by Alexander Pfister, and uh, Great Western Trail involves you running around a board, running around a trail, so to speak. Let me see if I can find some pictures of it. But it's one where where it's a it's a heavy Euro game that is not actually that heavy. A lot going on, a lot to be mindful of, but once you get that, that core gameplay down, it's pretty simple. You're basically moving from one location to another, moving along this trail, constructing buildings, building up a hand of cattle, got a little bit of deck building going on in the game, to basically sell those cattle when you get to Kansas City, and then start again up the trail. So you're basically repeating that cycle, and it's all about the process and the buildings you build and the way you most combine your actions to the most efficient way whatever it is solid solid engine one that i really enjoyed but but something about it 
has kept it from being one of the Euro games I love. It is a Euro game I really like. It is a Euro game I'm happy to try, happy to play. And it's one that has me paying attention to anything Alexander Fister puts out just because it was good enough. But it's not one that I ultimately kept. Although, again, I may, I may get it back because anything that I liked, you slap new and shiny on it and suddenly I'm more interested in it again. Moving on to Star Wars Rebellion. Star Wars Rebellion is a game that I thought was excellent. It perfectly captured and encapsulated the feeling of being in the movies. You have the Empire who feels overpowered and you have the Resistance who feels like they can never get things done against an overwhelming force and yet the Resistance will win because it was just like in the movies, it's not about the, the force in this game. It's about can you hide long enough? Can you tactically hold out until you get to the point where you can actually win this game? It's very well done. It's very well executed and mimicked in terms of what it brings to the table and the way it mimics that, that, that Star Wars feeling. And yet... It is a two-player game that runs two to four hours long, which, practically speaking, in my collection, two-player games that cross that two-hour mark are very rare in terms of staying in my collection. I just don't play those with people. I like them. Star Wars Rebellion is excellent. You know, put me in an old-age home one day with someone else who knows the game. Maybe I'll play it for a long time. I think it's a great game. I just don't play three-hour-long two-player games right now. My game group doesn't really have that... I don't know if I have anything in my collection that's two players and three hours long. Two hours tends to be the cusp uh, of how long a two-player game lasts for, for us, for me, for my wife, for my group, for my ever. So, that's going to be Star Wars Rebellion. Then we have Yinch. Yinch is one of the few games in the GIF series that I have left. This is The GIF series in general is this beautiful series of games. This board you're seeing over here is not what my Yinch board looks like. I want that one. But ultimately, the Yinch, Yinch series, the GIF series, is a game of abstract games using black and white components, mostly black and white components, and there's a few games around it. I liked all of the games I've played in the GIF series, but one at a time they have fallen from my collection. The two that I have left are going to be GIF and SAR. GIF, uh, Yinch and SAR. Yinch is the one that feels most like Othello. It has a introductory element that I enjoy introducing it to two new people, to new gamers, to the hobby. Uh, SAR ultimately is my personal favorite. My wife enjoys Yinch more, but ultimately Yinch is one that I still really enjoy and still end up playing. From there we have Quirky Circuits. Quirky Circuits, a game that I meant to review a long time ago and then just never got around to it. Too many games, too many things to review, to cover, and all that. Quirky Circuits is a game that replaced Magic Maze for me. Magic Maze is a game that I did enjoy, went through the whole thing, and I finished it. To be fair, Quirky Circuits, I haven't actually finished going through it, so it could be that when I'm done going through it, I, I, that might be enough for me because this game is basically a game of, of players not being able to talk to each other, trying to accomplish a goal as you try to get your, your tokens or whatever it is to move around the board. I don't think those cats are in the, the miniatures in the game. I can't remember. I think they're miniatures in the game. It's been a while since I play this. But effectively, you're trying to get your, your, your robots or whatever it is to run around the board to do what they need to do. And you're doing that through playing of cards, but you're playing them in a specific sequence in a specific order without communicating. So you have to kind of mentally know, similar to the mind, where you have this aspect of knowing that someone's going to play a card in this order than that or than this order same thing in this game you're relying on the fact that well we all know that the cat has to go forward three spaces so so we'll wait till the people play those cards great now i'll play my card that turns it left but you're playing all these cards face down so you're kind of working on this idea that you probably know how each people are going to play their cards works really well no communication lots of laughter and fun as you scream at your opponents how dare you have played that card as you move on to the next game Old West Impressio, a game by Stan Kodonsky, a game that I really enjoyed, and I would have kept this one if not for the fact that I played Old West Impressio around the same time that I played Shadow Kingdoms of Valeria, the prototype for Shadow Kingdoms of Valeria, and I liked both games, but I preferred Shadow Kingdoms of Valeria. I thought that was a better game, one that I personally preferred and would rather get that one to the table, so so I didn't keep Old West Impressio. I, I backed Shadow Kingdoms of Valeria instead, and I'm waiting for that one. Moving on, we have Anachrony. Anachrony, a game that I think I actually have this on this list a little bit later again, but either way, we're only going to cover it once. Anachrony is a game by Man Clash Games that I absolutely need to play. I got this one back at the beginning. I got this not back. I got this one, this game at the beginning of the pandemic, at the beginning of COVID. I read the rules, but we had no game groups, and I haven't played it yet, yet since. I know there's a solo mode, but I don't like playing these heavier games solo first because then my game group's at a disadvantage when I have kind of gotten that first play and I've rocked the systems a little bit more than they have. This is a game where you're borrowing resources from yourself in the future, but you have to pay them back so you have to basically pay them back when it comes time it's a balance of heavy mechanics in a game that seems to be well a lot of people seem to really like this game i'm sure i will or maybe i won't who really knows why am i so sure i'm not so sure but maybe i like it we'll see moving on we have cthulhu wars cthulhu wars a game that i have been meaning to get a rating to the table for a review of this one to the table this is one that i have a bunch of plays under my belt of i've, I've enjoyed it simul i've 
really enjoyed it while simultaneously not in any way being confident that it'll stay in my collection. Uh, Cthulhu Wars brings powers and abilities and asymmetric gameplay as people bring these unique, gigantic factions to the table. And as much as I enjoy aspects of Cthulhu Wars, I find myself preferring games like Kemet, preferring games like Chaos in the Old World, depending on what genre, theme, or gameplay you're going for. And when I play Cthulhu Wars, I generally feel a little bit more locked into the sequence of how you're going to upgrade your characters, because you have the factions. Your factions have these unique spellbooks, those tombs that you're going to be slowly unlocking, but I find that the variable pathways you have are not as not as there's not as many options as I would like. Now, one of the reasons I have kept through the wars for right now is because I have a lot of the extra Kickstarter content that I want to try. I want to see if that changes my opinion, my impression of the game. If it does, it may stay in my collection. If it doesn't, then Cthulhu Wars will be a game that I think is great and yet doesn't hold up in the area control genre for me. Then we have a Stars of Arcario. Stars of Arcario is a game that I did not back on Kickstarter at the time when it showed up. I started, I believe I covered this one briefly way back when I first started doing content creation. I talked about it. I don't remember a lot about it. I remember that it looked fairly ambitious at the time. It looked fairly expensive at the time too. It funded. I can't remember how much did it bring in. It brought in, it brought in a decent amount. 920,000. Wow. Holy, this is, they did really well for themselves. Uh, 7,542 backers. They have a lot of people they managed to pull in with this game. And good for them. Uh, I'm very intrigued by this one. This is one that I think uh, more and more I've seen people talk about this, talk about the pledge manager, talk about the updates, talk about this company with nothing but positive, well, positive things to say. Uh, for myself, the combination of the app and then the general ambition of the game and the lack of me being personally pulled in at the time was why I didn't back it at the time. But I'm, I'm paying attention because I keep hearing good things about it. So, so we'll see. 7,542 people can't be wrong, can they? They can be wrong, they can, but we'll, we'll ultimately see if they are this time. Moving on, we have Rurik, Dawn of Kiev. The specific question on this one was, do you still play this one? And the answer is, yes, yes, I do. Rurik, Dawn of Kiev is a game we actually almost pulled it out this weekend. Uh, we didn't, we picked something else, but we came this close. We played Terraforming Mars instead. I have no regrets. Terraforming Mars is one of my favorite games of all time. I'm talking this fast in this video, by the way, because I know how many tabs there are. Let me just go ahead and show you how many tabs there are. I'm going to scroll, sh shoot this down. Look at that. That's how many tabs there are. So we have all those tabs over there, and that's basically going to be, so yeah, anyways, uh, Rurik. Rurik is a game that brings area control and has this action programming aspect as you put down your advisors on a board. You put down your advisors and on a tableau to try to figure out the strength of your action and the timing of your action. You primarily want to get the best actions as soon as possible, but you can't have it both ways. Usually the, the stronger actions you take will happen later in the round as you place your advisors that are, are basically a five will go will be stronger, will get you the action, but it'll go later. So there's this constant balance of trying to take the actions when you want them and where you want them. You're never going to get everything you want. It comes down to choosing the right action and trying to read other players where are they going to try where are they going to try to outpace you where are they going to give up lots of decisions to be made in this game i really enjoy it the expansion which i had the opportunity to play as a prototype i like the expansion a lot i'm excited for what it brings to the table overall yeah i still play work still think it's excellent and it does hold up in the area control genre for me moving on we have cosmic frog cosmic frog i'm going to expand this tab a little bit cosmic frog is a game that the question on this one, well, well, I mean, the question was, you know, want to cover it or whatnot. Uh, Cosmic Frog is a game that looks interesting to me, but I am simultaneously intrigued and totally not intrigued at the same time. This is a game of gigantic frogs basically eating and swallowing planets. I cannot understand how this game plays. I cannot really get behind the theme of the game. Uh, the core gameplay, I've heard it's good. I mean, 7.6, nothing to sneeze at, and that's from a fairly new game still. So overall, this is one that I'm very intrigued by what the game is trying to do. It seems very ambitious. I mean, what is this person wearing in this costume? That is insanity, but I appreciate the the commitment but a cosmic frog a game of eating giant planets with your giant frogs i am intrigued but also uh, unsure yeah anyways moving on we have glenmore chronicles a game that i have and i i, I i'm still on the fence of this one so overall, I love Glenmore. I think Glenmore is a solid system, and yet it falls into the category of those games that no one in my group really asks to play. I love the system of gathering tiles. I love the person board on the side as you try to put down your tokens and lock in these extra abilities. I love the fact that the person who's last goes again multiple times, so you can get that perfect tile or you can go multiple turns. But then again, if you have a larger tableau than other players, you will lose points for that as well. So ensure that the tiles you get, make sure that they are doing enough extra for you that they're worth the dinging of points you're going to get for having more tiles than your opponents. Lots of tough decisions to be made in this game, all based on the idea that you kind of want a lot of things and other people will get there first. So you have to try to think through the best way for you to get there first. Lots of fun decisions to be made in this game. I adore the game. I think it's amazing. And yet no one in my group asks to play it. So I'm constantly looking at it. Every time I want to call games, I'm looking at Glenmore Chronicles, not because I don't like it, but because nobody asks to play this game with me. I need, 
I need better friends. That's what we're going to work on next. Anyways, we have Monumental. Monumental is a game that, uh, the question in this one was, what's the big deal? What's the hype? And the answer is, you should not back this game. You shouldn't get this game. It's an expensive game. It's an expensive version of Dominion. It's a $300 version of Dominion. Then again, if you get all the Dominion stuff, that's also a $300 version of Dominion, but it'll have more gameplay content around it. Mo Monumental is a game that gives you amazing miniatures, amazing board presence, gorgeous art coming to you from Fun Forge. I think this game is excellent. I really like it. Also, it takes up a lot of space on the table with your get a tableau. You're going to have a 9 by nine set of cards you're trying to build out and rotate to take your actions lots going on but i really appreciate the empire building in this game i've actually enjoyed this most two player i have not yet had the chance to play it solo it does have a solo mode overall i think monumental is excellent i'm looking forward to my pledge of african empires to come in along with those titans i don't actually want the titans the titans seem over the top i back the titans because they're gigantic over the top miniatures doesn't mean i should have backed the titans because they're gigantic over the top miniatures and who's to say what gameplay look at these things these are ridiculous the size of these things absolutely ridiculous the price of these things absolutely ridiculous ridiculous and people are complaining about the witcher old world you should take a look at the behemoth and the typhoon from monumental then let's come back and have a conversation about overpriced miniatures in any case moving on to last light a game that well we don't know that much about this game because nothing's really been changing yet i mean that's not true we know a lot about the game but nothing's really changed in the past few months this is a game that is coming to kickstarter i believe in the second half of 2021 we are very very close to the second half of 2021 which means we don't actually have a lot of information about exactly when this will be coming to kickstarter but some point soon this is coming to you from Roy Canada and this is going to be published by Gray Fox Games. This is a game that is basically bringing you asymmetric 4X games. So asymmetric? No, that's not the right word different words simultaneous play simultaneous play that's the word i'm looking for this is when you use simultaneous play in a 4x game a game that we played on tabletop simulator for the first time in a 90 minute game with four players with rules on tabletop simulator for the first time that is impressive for a 4x game this game brings a lot to the table i am very interested in the in the final version of the game i want to see the production values of this thing because so far all we really have here is this page which doesn't really inspire all that co much confidence that said everyone i know who has played it has enjoyed it i'm very intrigued very excited looking forward to last light moving moving on moving on we have the following we have a specific request to for all the heavier Uwe Rosenberg games I've played so I just grabbed a few not all of them I left a few off but I grabbed a few of them to talk about them Le Havre is going to be my personal favorite Uwe Rosenberg game to date still my favorite one from all the ones I've played I, I adore Le Havre lots of fun stuff as you go through this chaining of you're going to generate wood to do this you're going to generate clay to build that you're going to generate a steel production line where you turn steel into this and then that tons of stuff going on as you build and utilize different buildings in Le Havre you need the expansion the little box of cards that gives you a ton of different ways to play like a agricole it's going to give you just more and more ways to kind of slightly customize your lahav experience giving you just a little more puzzly stuff going on uh, from there we have a feast for odin one that i have played ranked higher than lahav i don't like it as much as lahav i'm intrigued by a feast for odin because my problem with the feast for odin is it combines the the heaviness of a uh, uwe rosenberg game with a side polyomino experience which has me baffled every time i play it it has me confused as to what game am i playing am i playing a polyomino puzzle am i playing a heavy euro granted you could be playing both but it feels out of place i mean look at this look at this combination of general always general thing of just generating stuff and worker placement and tons and tons of places where you can put your characters and then combine that with a polyomino experience on your personal player boards and your side islands that you generate lots of fun things going on in a feast for odin moving on we have at the gates of liang one that i really enjoyed for a long time eventually moved on from this one i found the gameplay a little too repetitive a little too samey every single time you played it but the aspect of trying to appeal to to appease your customers and to constantly keep them happy as you go through at the gates of liang it was a rewarding experience one that i have no regrets for but did move on from then we have agricola agricola is going to be one that well oh look at that look at that. that's adorable agricola that's cute anyways agricola is going to be that's the agricola agricola is going to be one that is my arguably my first away rosenberg game i'm not sure i may have played laha first but this is one that while I liked, and while I'm always intrigued by the promise of the tons and tons of cards you can get for this game, it's one that did not stay in my collection because, well, first of all, my wife did not enjoy feeding her people, and this was back when I first got into gaming, the only person I played with at the time was my wife, but even past that, while I enjoyed Agricola, Agricola, I never felt the need to fight for this one. I am far more intrigued by Caverna, a game I have, but have not played. Moving on, he asked for, well, he also asked for any, um, any... Lacerda games that I've played, and the answer is I have not played any Lacerda games. I have some on my shelf. I do need to play them. Then we have Sorcerer. Sorcerer by by Wise Wizard Games. This is one that I have. I actually kind of want to play this one. I've read the rules. I set it up, and then someone dropped by, and I put it away because it just we didn't end up playing it. But this I set up to play with my wife. It's a two-player game. I think it's a two-player. It's a two-player only. I don't actually know. Let's see. Two-player only or not is going to be two-player only. Two to four players. So yeah, this is a two to four-player game. Uh, I, from what I've heard, it's best with two. You can see over here. 
here seems like very whoa very heavily best with two if you don't know this tool on board game geek where you can check the ratings of what a game is best with you should definitely know that but overall the high rating of a 7.8 is nothing to sneeze at i am intrigued by sorcerer i want to give this one a shot i just haven't gotten around to it yet then we have sword and sorcery a game that i read the rule book like three times to play this game this is a 50 page rule book a lot going on a lot of nuance nitty-gritty and a universe that is so expansive there's a ton of ways you can develop and augment and increase your experience in this game which is why i'm kind of happy that i don't love this game because there's so 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 much stuff in this game i enjoyed my plays of sword and sorcery i thought it was a fine game i thought it was great but the amount of work to get it to the table the amount of work to set it up the amount of work to constantly be on top of the rules there was too much going on that i wasn't invested enough in the gameplay of sword and sorcery i think it is excellent i think it is involved i think people who like dungeon crawlers will like this one for myself i merely liked it not enough to continue investing in the universe that is sword and sorcery then we have Shard Hunters. Shard Hunters, my Lycan Studio. This is going to be the same people who brought you Asonia. Asonia, which I do love. Shard Hunters, I have on my shelf. I have not had a chance to play it. I'm intrigued by it. I mean, it's a light little card game. No idea if I'll like it or not, but I mean, the art looks cool, so, so we'll see. Moving on, we have Human Interface Be a Better Human, a game that I've never heard about until it was put on this list. The miniatures look great. I don't know anything about this. A 6.6 .6 on Board Game Geek is not great. It's not the worst, but it's not inspiring either. 2018, solid miniatures and a 6.6. .6. I think this is going to be a hard pass for me in terms of checking into this one further. Then we have Call to Adventure, a game that looked really intriguing, but I didn't really feel it at all. This is a game that felt more about the story you're developing, about like, you know, oh, look, you're going to develop your character and you're going to have these moments and choices and all these things. And ultimately for myself, it felt like you flipped a bunch of runes, you grabbed a few cards, and then you kind of finished a game. It, I, I didn't, I didn't buy into this one at all. Nothing about this game inspired me. It wasn't bad by any means, but I just, I I couldn't figure out what it was that drew people into this game. It didn't it didn't do it for me. From there, we have Sleeping Gods, a game that I completely understand why it would draw some people. This is Ryan Lockett. This is the, Ryan Lockett. This is going to be from the, I mean, the amount of stuff they put out as a team, the amount of stuff, games they put out, the beautiful artwork, the game development, all those things are inspiring confidence, but I still haven't gotten around to really loving his games. I tried Above and Below once, and I kind of didn't get into it, and then I never really got into the rest. I never got into Near and Far. I never got up into... What else are there? There's more than that. There's more than those ones. But either way, I never really got into them. And while I am intrigued by Sleeping Gods, especially with all the praise I've seen from a lot of people, I've also finally started to see some negative feedbacks and critiques as well. And so um, I might get this one. I might try it out. I'm certainly intrigued, but not haven't given it a shot yet. From there, we have Abyss. Abyss is a game that, granted, it's a 7.3, which also is on the lower end of things, and one that I arguably would not be paying attention to, but ever since I played Aquatica, Aquatica is a game that I love. It's one of the, I think, the one of the seven games I gave a 5 to in 2021 so far, a 5 to 5. And Aquatica, I absolutely adored, absolutely loved it, and while the gameplay of these two, I have no idea if there's any similarities at all, just the general idea of a card-based underwater game had me paying more attention to Abyss. So I actually have this one on the way as we speak, as we speak based on when I'm filming this video. No idea when this video is actually going up. But so yeah, Abyss is one that I am intrigued by. I don't know if I'll love it. Again, 7.3 is not inspiring. It, it's good, but I mean, there are there are 7.3s. What's Carson City? Carson City, I think, is a 7.3. That's really a shame. I think Carson City is amazing. And it is a 7.2. Oh my gosh, that means Abyss is amazing because Carson City is amazing, okay? Carson City should not be a 7.2. That is a conversation for another day. We'll talk about my top 10 underrated games at some point. Carson City will be on the list. I guarantee it. Moving on, we have COG, a game that I've never heard of, and at a 6.7, I'm not looking into that much further. Uh, from there, we have Belfort, a 7.2. I don't know why I'm getting focused on all these ratings all of a sudden, but either way, Belfort is a game by Jay Cormier. Oh, this is by Jay Cormier and Sen Fung Liam. That's awesome. Oh, I just did, I just played My Singing Monsters for them. But effectively, uh, Belfort is a game that I, I paid attention to. This is 2011, keep in mind. So I got into the hobby in 2012, which means I acquired Belfort at roughly at the time, along with a deluge of games as I got overly obsessed and pulled into the hobby. I never actually played Belfort. For it. It's one of the. It's one of a good hundred games, I would say, that in in a, in the time for my first year in the hobby, there were a good hundred games that I got that were, I never actually got to the table, I never played them. I got more than hundred games, by the way. I got like 500 games, but tons of them I played, tons of them I did, and then others kind of sat there on the shelves and never really got a time and attention and eventually I moved on from, and Belfort is one of those games. I, I was intrigued by it, but I never actually got to the table, sadly enough. 
Then we have Steampunk Rally, a game by Roxley Games. This is one that I backed on Kickstarter because I backed their Santorini and then I basically backed everything they've put out since. Well, I actually kind of finally stopped backing everything, but I still back a lot of the stuff. Roxley Games, the company that puts out beautiful, over-the-top, ridiculously amazing looking games. And Steampunk Rally is one that I really, really enjoyed this one. I thought it was a solid system, a solid game. It has drafting and building up your Steampunk engine as you race across the track. I really enjoyed what the game was doing, but also it fell into the category of one of those games that others didn't ask to play and I didn't feel the need to fight for. I like the puzzle of building up your engine. I think my biggest critique of it would be the fact that you kind of all felt that you're playing your own little separate game and you, did, you, couldn't, you didn't have the time or attention or energy to cross check what others are doing to see did you build your ship correctly? Did you not? Did you do the right action? Did you mess up over here? Far too much going on in this game, especially at higher player counts that, and at lower player counts, you don't have the interaction on the map. At higher player counts, you have the interaction, but there's no way you know what other people are doing. It felt a little bit like multiplayer solitaire with a little bit of map interaction. I enjoyed it. I thought it was solid, but one that I moved on from. Uh, speaking of moving on, we have Tungaroo. Tungaroo, a game that I have heard good things about this one. I haven't gotten the chance to play it. I'm intrigued. The art looks good. The, again, 7.2 is not, 7.2s don't scare me away. That's already a high. Anything above a 7 is my, my threshold. Below a 7, I basically have to have someone personally recommend the game for me to try it, but above a seven i'll still pay attention to it art looks cool game looks cool don't know much about it unfortunately uh, from there we have zoography a game that i was intrigued by haven't got this one to the table there's a lot of these like more zoo themed games there's new york zoo actually which new york zoo will be talking about shortly but zoography i'm curious about but i haven't really looked into it enough to decide to get it or not uh, then we have habitats another well another by the way these are all just in the order people asked about them that's the order everything's in but habitats is one that i never really looked into this from 2016 somehow this one missed my radar i only really heard about it this past year and just haven't making the time, effort, or attention to look into it enough to decide if I should get it or not. I don't know if this is from the actual game. I imagine that's not. That seems like a, it's a prototype. Okay, good. Because if that's what the final game looks like, then I, I wouldn't be interested. Uh, moving on, we have Mystic Veil, vale, a game by John D. Clare. This is going to be not the first game in the card crafting series system, but I think the first game that was popular in the craft card crafting system. It's one that I never really got the chance to look into heavily. I kind of skipped through most of the card crafting games and didn't really get any of them until I actually had a chance to play Dead Reckoning. Dead Reckoning to me is, well, I mean, it's incredible. It's amazing. It's one that I'm absolutely very excited for my pledge to arrive because, well, no, I sorry, I, I canceled Dead, my pledge at Dead Reckoning. My bad. Uh, but Dead Reckoning was a game that I did back it. I canceled my pledge. Longer story. I will get my hands on a copy of it at some point, probably on the secondhand market or retail and whatnot, but I'm very excited for when that game actually shows up, for when, it, when I can actually get a copy to my table because Dead Reckoning is... Is, was such a fun experience that I haven't, I, I'm intrigued. I'm intrigued by Mystic Veil. I'm intrigued by Edge of Darkness. I want to give those a shot just because I played Dead Reckoning. Moving on, we have Summoner Wars Master Set, a game I played once a long time ago with my wife and we weren't pulled in by it. We tried it. We didn't love it. We got rid of it. But hey, they have a second edition now, so I should get a second edition because, I mean, new and shiny, right? So it must be better. It's a second edition, right? Right? Someone stop me. And then we have Catacombs and Castles. I never played the Catacomb system of game. The Catacomb system of games involves basically flicking discs around the map. It's kind of a hybrid of kind of dungeon-y stuff uh, combined with, you know, dexterity flicking and whatnot. I've always been intrigued by the system, but I found that most flicking games that aren't Crokinole don't generally last. I find they're cute, nice, fun gimmicks, but gimmicks, and, and that's where it kind of ends. And usually the ratings reflect that. Usually ratings on these games are on the lower end. Ooh, that's fun, but it's not amazing. It's It relies on a gimmick that is best served in its pure form of playing a game like Crokinole where the game is the gimmick as opposed to where the game is augmented by the gimmick. Ascending Empires, uh, Flick of Faith, uh, Catacombs, all of those are games that are decently rated but not amazingly rated and they haven't pulled me in from the ones I've played. I've enjoyed them all from the ones I've played. I haven't kept any from the ones I've played. From there, we have Empire's Age of Discovery by Glenn Drover. Glenn Drover, who I actually just reviewed Mosaic by Glenn Drover. Love Mosaic. Thought it was excellent. But, Maul, I love Mosaic. I don't... Which one do I like more? It's a tough one. So I think I would say this. I think I prefer Empire's Age of Discovery. I think it's a better game. But I think that Mosaic is more accessible and easier to table in terms of just how easy it is to teach and get it out. But Empire's Age of Discovery is one of my favorite games. This is in my top 50. It is such a solid experience. It's one that I haven't played in a while. But you have this worker placement market in this game and you're trying to slowly but surely spread it across the board and conquer all these areas and then get these resources and get sets of resources and then acquire unique buildings as you plan and acquire unique workers. 
Such a solid game. Really enjoyed this one. I, I, I have not played this one in over a year. I really need to get to the table. But Empire Age of Discovery is a solid, solid game. Uh, from there, we have Seventh Citadel. Seventh Citadel, a game that is, to me, the reason why I got rid of Seventh Continent. I enjoy Seventh Continent. Don't get me wrong. I think Seventh Continent is an excellent experience that everyone should try at some point, unless you skip directly to Seventh Citadel. Now, actually, interestingly enough, I think that while Seventh Citadel is probably still... Well, I prefer Seventh Citadel. I don't know if Seventh Citadel is a better entry point. I think Seventh, Seventh Continent is a little more streamlined, a little simpler, and a better entry point to the general concept and genre of what it's trying to do. But I preferred the story in Seventh Citadel immensely. Seventh, Con Seventh Citadel. I enjoyed the story in Seventh Citadel immensely, much more so than Seventh Continent. Granted, I had a prototype with like a single, you know, hour and a half of gameplay that, it, while enjoyable, I don't know how well that carries over to the general larger ecosystem. I hope it does because I really was much more invested and what was happening in 7th Citadel as opposed to 7th Continent. Either way, both are excellent games. I think that they should be tried at some point by everyone because they are so unique and incredible in what they are doing. Moving on, we have The Resistance Avalon, a game that I still own and still love. One Night Ultimate World has replaced it as my default go-to hidden role guessing game, but I do love Resistance Avalon. It is streamlined, it is pure, it is it is immensely fun to have those games where you have your characters and you're trying to figure out who's who, what people are doing in the game. Lots of tension lots of yelling at each other, lots of screaming, lots of betrayal and whatnot. I'm very much looking forward to Quest, Quest which re-implemented the Resistance Avalon as well as bringing new cards, new art, new rules. I believe this one's shipping soon actually. Very excited for this one. I may get rid of Resistance Avalon once I have Quest Avalon. From there we have Storm Sunder Errors of Ruin. The specific question I got on this one was, is it ever going to deliver? I imagine yes. Uh, so Lazy Squire Games is a company that has produced, well I mean first of all they produced Wild Descent which I think is incredible. I really enjoy Wild Descent. That's another game that I gave a 5 out of 5 to in, this, in 2021. But Storm Thunder was their more ambitious follow-up. Now, this is a lot of money raised in a very short time frame. More coming in the Pledge Manager. I guarantee in the Pledge Manager this thing has crossed a million dollars. No question whatsoever. Tons of content, tons of miniatures. And they ran like an eight-day campaign, which is insane. Eight days is a... I mean, I get no people who don't want to do 30-day campaigns. But like do 14 days, 16 days. So you have two full weekends, something, whatever it is. Eight days is... Well, very, very, very short. But that said, Storm Thunder, I think, absolutely will deliver. I think Lazy Squire Games, as a company, have likely put themselves in a place where they're running on longer timelines than I would like, than I arguably any of you would like. They're not going to hit that March 2022 deadline, almost guaranteed. I'm very I'm very excited for Storm Thunder. I'm very intrigued by Storm Thunder. I am sure it will deliver. Not like I'm not betting the bank on it, but I'm sure it will deliver. But it's ambitious, it's cool, also probably will be late. From there, we have Viticulture Essential Edition, a game that I will have a review for this one. This one is excellent. Oh my gosh, speaking of 5 out of 5s, this one's going to get a 5 out of 5 when it comes out. So, I mean, this is not from 2021. This is from, well, Viticulture Essential Edition is from 2015. The original Viticulture is even earlier. I think 2012, if I'm not mistaken. Let's see. It's from 2013, is original Viticulture. This is my favorite Stone Mario games, games by far. It is an incredible experience. Very solid in the what it's doing, in the work of placement, the sequential work of placement it builds up, and all the cards that keep the game fresh every single time, just with tons of cards. Ooh, I want those crates. Those are delightful little crates. Those are not in the actual game. But I do have my own form of upgrades in this game. I've talked about This is so cute. I love these crates. Oh my gosh, whatever. In any case, Viticulture is an excellent, excellent game. My favorite Stone Mario games by far. Uh, from there, we have New York Zoo, like I mentioned already. This is from Uwe Rosenberg, who brought you games like Patchwork. And New York Zoo is supposed to be an incredible little experience. But I've also heard from people who play it that Baron Park is better. And I love Baron Park and I have Baron Park. So do I need New York Zoo in my collection? It's one that I assume I will try at some point, but I don't know when at some point will be. I don't currently have the drive to actually get this one to the table at the moment. Again, Polyominoes. I love Polyominoes, but I've already heard from too many people that this is a good Polyomino games, but that there are better ones out there. From there, we have Maglev Metro. This is going to be coming in from Bezier Games. This is one that I am intrigued by. I'm kind of not in a rush to get this one to the table. I like, in general, I like train games. I like that, you know, element of trying to move your system from here to there. I love Steam by Martin Wallace. Solid game. But the Maglev Metro has this interesting aspect of these acrylic tiles that you put on top of each other, and it creates these pathways, and you can overlay paths on top of each other. Seems is very intriguing. I'm very intrigued by whether that is more of a gimmick or a solid a puzzle aspect to the game. Overall, I'm interested in it. I, I anticipate trying it at some point, but I just haven't haven't really gotten a chance to do so yet. Uh, from there, we have Bargain Quest. Bargain Quest, a game that a lot of people loved, and I got it right away when it showed up and sat down said they loved it, and they recommended it, and then it was sold out everywhere, and I got my hands on a copy, and I was excited, and I played it, and I was totally let down by this one. I did not like Bargain Quest. I didn't see the appeal of being your little adventurer and, and just selling your goods to, like, buying goods from various merchants to gear up for that adventure. I I didn't like Bargain Quest. It's something about it just didn't do it for me. I think it's a solid game. I just I couldn't I couldn't see the real appeal past what the core concept was trying to do. 
From there, we have Res Arcana. Res Arcana by Thomas Lehman from Race to the Galaxy fame. This is a game that's just outside the top 100, a 7.8, and it's one that I, I need to read the rules again because I haven't played it in like three years. Uh, it's one that I enjoyed when we first got it. I kind of got rid of it because we, we enjoyed it but didn't love it, and then we got it back because we missed it, which I've done from time to time. Not frequently, but I do do that. And Res Arcana is one that I got back. It's on the shelf right next to me, actually. It's over here, technically. But I need to play this one, but I don't know when I'm going to play it because I have so many games I need to get to the table. But I'm intrigued by it. I want to play it again. I remember the puzzle aspect of it. I like turning things into other things, and Res Arcana certainly let you build up that engine in the game. From there, we have Suburbia. Suburbia is a game that I really liked. I really, not liked, like. I like this one. This is a game that I got the collector's edition. That's how much I like it. And every time I play it, I, I love the puzzle of building out your network and your framework and having that perfect system where you have this for each adjacent that, and for each adjacent that, and plus two for that, and get the airport that lets you do that. Lots of fun things going on in Suburbia, and like other games before it. No one asks to play this one with me. This is one that I always want to play, and no one actually wants to play it with me. I think it's a great game, but but it wasn't getting played, and so I, I moved on from Suburbia, but hey, you know, this is why I need new friends. I talked about this already. My friends are just, they're good. I like my friends, but I need new friends that like like the other games that the other friends don't like. Anyways, moving on to Near and Far. We talked about this already. I haven't played Near and Far. I haven't played Near and Far because I played Above and Below once and then never really went on Islebound. That was the other one. I knew there was another one I was thinking of. But yeah, I never really played Near and Far. I never played Islebound. I played Above and Below once and, and I should play these games. They're highly rated. They seem to be well loved, but just never, never really pulled me in enough. Uh, Pulsar 2849. I did play this one. This is by Vladimir Shuzi and it's a one that he's the one who uh, just did um, Praga Kaput Regni, I believe, right? I think so. But anyways, Pulsar 2849 is a game that I really enjoyed, but also didn't didn't keep that one. It was a solid game as you build out your little... St I can't remember how it plays. It's like, it reminded me of Castle of Burgundy to a degree in terms of what it was doing. But overall, I really liked, I really liked Pulsar 2849. My wife and I played it a few times, and then we said, hey, that was good, but we'd rather play other games in this genre, other games that feel the same. So I liked it, but didn't end up keeping that one. Uh, Tricarian Legends of Illusion. I really want to get this game. I just have a rule in place at the moment that I cannot get this game until I've actually played Anachrony. Once I play Anachrony, I can get Tricarian. I don't have to like Anachrony. I just have to play Tricarian. I have to play Anachrony first. I have too many heavy games that aren't getting played right now. I just, I need to learn a lot of rules. A lot of games, I like a lot of games, but right now I find I mostly play new games that are lighter and heavier games that are older. I don't play as many heavier new games at the moment. Just a question of, of the time it takes to read, to comprehend, to be on top of these games. I have all the T-series. I have a whole bunch of games from, from uh, it's, uh, what's it called? Um, the Talaserta. I have a bunch of UA games, a bunch of so many games that I need to play in terms of the heavy game genre. Serbia, the inside world. Well, I mean, this one I just don't have an interest in this, in this one, unfortunately. And then Anachrony again, because I had the same person ask me for all the uh, trick all the trick uh, the Mind Clash games. And from there, Hadrian's Wall. This is one. Speaking of heavy games, I am immensely interested in Hadrian's Wall. This is the roll and write that has people baffled that it's a roll and write. Look at this. Look at this board over here, and tell me you're not incredibly overwhelmed because I'm not incredibly overwhelmed. I'm incredibly intrigued. I love complex roll and writes. My problem is even the most complicated of roll and writes that I've currently played still feel like they are lacking in terms of the replayability factor. When I play Ganshan Clever, when I play Fleet, I love the chaining pathways, but there's only so many times you can play them before you feel like you're still going through those same pathways again and again and again. I really want to play Hegrin's Wall. I need to get my hands on a copy of this one. I I'm intrigued. I'm very intrigued by a game that looks like this and is a roll and write. So, so color me incredibly interested in this one. Munchkin. I played this once. It was enough for me. Uh, to be fair, nothing against Munchkin. To be fair, I played this with eight players for the first time, and that was last time because it was a three and a half hour game of Munchkin. I will never, ever, ever do that again. Period. Moving on, we have Codenames Duet, which the question here is, what's my favorite version of Codenames? And my favorite version of Codenames is Codenames Duet. I love Codenames. Codenames is a solid party game. I find Codenames Duet gets more play, and, and you could also play it with teams as well if you really need to, so it doesn't eliminate the, the concept of having a more than two-player game. Uh, Codenames, Codenames, pure Codenames is better for four players, in my opinion, but if I could only have one, I would absolutely pick Codenames Duet. From there, we have Splendor. Splendor is a game that I really enjoyed when this game first came out. Actually, there's a new game coming out by Marc-Andre, a game called... A Soul Raiders, I think. Soul Raiders, which I'm intrigued by. But anyway, Splendor is a game that I I played it. I liked it. It's a solid game that you go through. You know, you're building up these cha you're building up these chains of, of cards. You have these cards you're getting that each one uh, you, you use your gems to acquire cards. Those cards in turn give you gems. That let you get more expensive cards, and you work your way up a tree to get the most expensive cards. Uh, overall, Splendor is one of the most satisfying tableau building games I've ever played. But also 
it's satisfying in the limited scope of what it's trying to do. I think it's one of the best gateway games I can recommend to people. It is a solid system that will pull people in as they want to do more. But after a certain number of plays, I moved on from Splendor. The role player. Role player is a game that for some reason hasn't stuck with me. By all accounts, I should love this game. And role player has me intrigued. I've played it. I've enjoyed it. But I haven't... I haven't loved it. Something about it. And I, I've heard I need to play the Monsters and Minions expansion. Maybe one day I will. I like World Player. Every time I played it, I've enjoyed it. But it doesn't have me pulled in. And so it hasn't stayed in my collection. It's one of those games that when I play it, I like it. And when I don't play it, I'm not thinking about it or asking to play it. Lords of Waterdeep, another gateway game that I really recommend and yet moved on from. Lords of Waterdeep was one in the first, you know, 30 or so games my wife and I ever got. We played it a ton. We got the expansion and played it a ton more. It is immensely satisfying to go through, but at a certain point in time, while it's a great worker placement, while it's a gate entry game, while it feels rewarding to cash in on all those quests and get their recurring quests that give you even more stuff so you can build up your tableau, lots of fun things going on in Lords of Waterdeep, but again, eventually I, I decided it wasn't for, it wasn't the game we were continuously excited about as we grew in our gaming lives or whatnot. Scythe. Scythe is a game by Stonemaier Games, and this falls into the same category as many Stonemaier Games that I've played, where, with the exception of Viticulture, which I love, in which Scythe is a game that I really, really liked, but didn't. it didn't cross that line for me. Similar to Wingspan, similar to uh, Tapestry, although Tapestry is a little lower for me, but other games, I, I find a lot of Stonemaier Games I have enjoyed but haven't loved. And Scythe is a game that, despite the high rankings, is coming in at 14 on board, number 14 on Boarding Geek, an 8.2. People love this game, and I liked it. I did. I really think Scythe is a lot of fun. I'd play it. I just, something about the core gameplay of this game, of this engine, just doesn't have me as intrigued as I should be. I, I find that I, I'm playing this fighting game that doesn't have fighting, and I'm playing this Euro game that feels like it should have fighting, and I know that's what it's going for, and yet, for me, it, it feels... It, fe it always felt a little bit removed from what I would ideally want this game to be. So, so that was that was Scythe. From there, we have Onita Onitama. Onitama is a two-player abstract game, which is very chess-like in what it's trying to do. We have the, the you can see over here what's going on over here. Although this looks like a fancier board than what I think you actually get, but in any case, you have this little pieces over here. Oh, the pieces are fancier too. Everything's fancier here. Anyways, in Onitama, you basically have these cards, and these cards are going to define your movement, but then when you use a card, you give it to your opponent. So you effectively, you always have two cards in front of you, and every time you use one, well, actually, it goes to the sideboard over here, then you get the card back, so you're constantly swapping cards to the side where they'll make their way to the opponent, which means you effectively are setting your opponent up for the moves that will take you out. Very clever abstract system, one that we got and didn't keep, but I really enjoyed it while we had it. Captain Sonar, a game that I really want to play, but it requires eight players to play it at the best, most ideal player count. Guess how often I have eight players at my table, even pre-pandemic? Not often enough. From there, we have Detective City of Angels, a game that, wow, this game is ranked pretty highly. I, I haven't looked into this game extensively. I've heard about it. I've seen it. It's just coming from Van Ryder Games. They put out a lot of good games. I haven't looked into this past knowing it exists, so so I didn't get it because I haven't looked into it. That's the short version. Uh, but am I intrigued by it? I'm intrigued by anything that's rated an eight, but... I don't know. Something about this game isn't calling my name. It's not calling my name. I'd happily play it because it's well rated, but not nothing about Detective City of Angels is pulling me in. Mystia. Mystia, a game that I have from Tabula Games. This is a game that is, well, it's supposed to be like Blood Rage from everything I've heard. Now, anything that anyone, anytime anyone says this game is like Blood Rage, I'm already paying attention because one of two things will happen. One of three things will happen. One of two things, three things, three things. Either it will be better than Blood Rage and I'll get rid of Blood Rage. It's not happening. It's not happening. Or it'll be as good as Blood Rage, but different enough that it's worth keeping both. That's possible. Or it'll be worse than Blood Rage, which is honestly the most likely of the three. But I still will pay attention when someone says a game is better than insert favorite name here. Because that's how you get the good games to begin with. Because guess what I had before Blood Rage? Well, not Blood Rage. I had something else. And now I have Blood Rage. So, so there's always a chance. Moving on, we have Terra Mystica. Terra Mystica, a game that I really... Oh, five left. We're finally making progress here. Terra Mystica is a game that I played and enjoyed, and I liked it enough that I got Gaia Project, have not played Gaia Project, did not keep Terra Mystica. Terra Mystica is one that... It's a really solid, heavy Euro game that does a lot of things, but every time I play it, I kind of feel like I want to get more done before that game is over. So I, I've always appreciated Terra Mystica. I think it's a brilliant game design, but I didn't end up keeping it because I feel, I feel more restricted than I want to when I play this game. Vinos. Vinos is one of the few games that I read the rule book and then moved on from. Uh, oh, I guess I have played a sort of game. Wait, did I play? So I got Vinos. I got Vinos way back when I first started gaming. Like my first year of gaming. So so I wouldn't hold the fact that I I was intimidated by the rule book. I read the rules. I was not pulled in by it. I, I just thought the whole thing seemed like a mess. 
I didn't realize. I think I knew it was Lacerda, but I didn't realize that at the time when I played it because I didn't know who Lacerda was or any of these people. But Vinos is a game that I would happily try it again nowadays. At the time, I just remember thinking that I did. it just felt too complicated. Uh, I'm assuming that that's because it was one of the first games I played and I probably shouldn't have played it when I did. But it doesn't mean it'll be for me now. But I kind of want to try it again now because I played it a really long time ago and, and, and I probably wasn't ready for it back then. From there, we have Thunderstone Quest. Again, I wanted to love this game so badly. The amount of content for this game, the amount of, of the, the artwork's gorgeous, the general idea of a deck building game. I love all the stuff that's going on in this game in theory, and yet I, I wasn't pulled in by it. I can't explain why, what it is, but in terms of when I play this game, I would just rather play other deck building games. There's a ton of other deck building games that I prefer. Thunderstone Quest hasn't worked for me. I can't define the reason why that is, but it is what it is. I, I can't like everything. Munchkin Dungeon, a game that I have on the shelf because my wife said, ooh, there's a miniature version of Munchkin, I want to play that. And so we got this, and we haven't played it yet, so so at a certain point, we'll either play this one or it'll move on, but, I mean, look at these gorgeous painted miniatures, that, that's that's adorable. I didn't even back this one, I didn't back a Come On game, it happens, I got this later because my wife found out about it, and I was like, I want that game, and so I, I traded for it. I'm intrigued by it, but, but I mean... I don't know. It's Munchkin Dungeon. We'll see. And then lastly on this list, we have Dinosaur Island, a game that I played and enjoyed enough to back Dinosaur World, but I didn't actually keep Dinosaur Island. I actually got rid of Dinosaur Island already, but I was like, hey, this is a cool game. Let me back Dinosaur World and try that one. Uh, Dinosaur Island, I like the general gameplay, but the theme is such a turnoff for me. Not the theme. The colorization of the game is such a turnoff for me. I am not pulled in by it at all. And so I'm really hoping I like Dinosaur World because if I don't, then I'll kind of want Dinosaur Island back. It was a cool game, but either way... We shall see. And that is basically your entire list of games. I don't know what the count of games is. I guess we'll see it when I timestamp it up. But we are 45 minutes in because, I mean, I probably didn't spend 30 seconds per game. I probably spent more than 30 seconds per game. Either way, this has been fun. Thanks so much for being here. I enjoyed running through way too many tabs full of games to talk about my initial brief or relatively brief thoughts on them. Until next time, I'm Alex Radcliffe from Board Game Co. And I hope you have a good one.